the night we're in Chichester. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Vicky Ford, a former MEP, elected as a Conservative MP in 2017. She supports Jeremy Hunt in the Tory leadership contest. Louise Haig, an MP since 2015 and Labour's Shadow Policing Minister. Sean Berry, a member of the London Assembly and co-leader of the Green Party in England and Wales. Vote Leave campaigner and now a reporter on the right-leaning online political website Guido Fawkes, Tom Harwood and personal finance guru, broadcaster and founder of MoneySavingExpert.com, Martin Lewis. <laughs> Welcome to our panel, to our audience here, and of course, to you at home. You can join in the conversation, as always, using hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, on Facebook and on Instagram. Right, without further ado, let's get started with our first question tonight, which is from Harry Peverley. Is lifting the ban on fox hunting a move we should even be considering in 2019? Tom. Yeah, should we be considering this right now? Absolutely not. I, I, I take issue with you, Martin. I don't think that Jeremy Hunt cocked up. I just don't think he's a very good politician. This has happened time and time again. <laughs> he's, he's given an answer to a question. So, for example, he's asked about his views on abortion. He says that we should restrict a woman's right, right to choose. And then he's asked about it again once an uproar's happened. He says, oh, yeah, no, I believe that, but I don't want to do it. And then he's asked, uh, what do you think about fox hunting? Yeah, yeah, no, we should absolutely allow that again. And then he's asked again after a bit of an uproar. He says, yeah, I believe that, but I don't want to do it. This is someone who presumably wants to be prime minister to do nothing that he believes in. I don't quite understand his worldview <laughs> as a politician. Woman in the pink dress. We've talked about Jeremy Hunt at some length here. What about Boris, Tom? What's your view on his spending pledges? Has he found a magic money tree, do you think? I'm not sure anyone's found a magic money tree. I don't quite believe in sort of the Labour Party, Green Party economics like that. Um, but what I would say is there's still a deficit in this country. We still pay £40 billion a year more than we take in in tax. And so that's a problem that's going to need to be solved by whoever comes in. Yes, it's massively down from the over 100 billion a year it was before 2010, but there's still more to do. And yes, uh, debt is falling as a proportion of GDP, but that's not good enough. It needs to be falling in real terms. But also, I do want to agree with, um, with Vicky because there are taxes that you can cut that spur economic growth, that bring in more revenue. There's something called the Laffer Curve, which shows this. There's evidence in terms of this country, in terms of corporation tax, over the last nine years, it's brought in more revenue as the rate has been brought down. If you spur economic growth, you can bring more in. But, I mean, if we're going to start talking about, as, as Sean mentioned, about the uh, about fixing the problems that, that led to that yeah, referendum campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the most important one would be actually leaving the European Union, which I'm not sure you're in favour of. <laughs> <laughs> How is leaving the European Union going to lead to more investment in the areas that voted to leave? Uh, I mean, if you list, Caroline Lucas has been visiting leave voting places all around the country. They are crying out for reversals of things like the bus cuts that were mentioned, for more police officers on the street, but also more youth clubs that have been cut back right across the country. How is leaving the European Union going to help us focus on these very, very real problems? Well, very clearly, we're a massive net contributor to the European Union budget. We're the second largest net contributor after... literally giving me the bus number? After, I'm going to give you... Absolutely, there was, a court, there was a court ruling, actually, just yesterday, that found that number is correct, gross, and the, and right, the net right, number... Yes. And the yeah, net and number is about 10.5 billion year, okay. a year. That's a massive amount, 10.5 billion pounds a year. We're throwing away to Brussels that we could be spending in this country. If you're going to deny that as an argument, you're going to lose another referendum. Was the behaviour of the Brexit M MEPs in the European Parliament this week cheerfully defiant or childish and disrespectful? So, so the Brexit MEPs uh, turned their back, didn't they, while the anthem, the EU anthem, Ode to Joy, was, was being played. And Nigel Farage said the party were being cheerfully defiant, a Labour MP said they were being childish and disrespectful. Uh, what's your view on that, Tom? Well, there were two stunts, weren't there? The Liberal Democrats turned up with T-shirts with swear words on them. 
and the Brexit party... We can say that word at this time of night. We can say bollocks. Well, oh, great can, fun. Yeah. It um, <laughs> it's not the first time it's been said on question time, I've got to tell you. So don't get right, too excited. Right. How many times can we say it? <laughs> <laughs> Steady. Right, so the Lib Dems turn up in bright yellow garish T-shirts, um, disobeying the dress code of any normal parliament in the world, um, and, and, and make their protest that way. The Brexit party turn their backs to an anthem that the United Kingdom actually opted out of in the Lisbon Treaty. One of the reasons why the European Constitution was defeated in France and in the Netherlands and right across Europe, and it was repackaged as the Lisbon Treaty and Forster anyway in true democratic EU style, is because it included all these attributes and trappings of nationhood, a flag, an anthem, presidents. It's quite right to turn your back on that. That's one of the main reasons why... Do you think why they could escaping... have made their protest in, in perhaps a slightly different way? I don't know what's more dignified than turning up quietly, not making any noise, not being like that man with a silly hat on that stands outside Parliament and shouting at people on the news, not making any sort of um, big uh, display like that, but quietly turning your back to an anthem of a pretend country that's trying to assert itself as a global player, <laughs> that's trying to federalise, that's centralising power, that's taking power away from national governments, taking money away from national governments, only to aggrandise itself with stretch limos for Jean-Claude Juncker, with embassies around the world. World, it's quite right to turn your back to this farce. It's a total and utter farce. A lot of people applauding. A lot of people sitting on their hands, uh, I'll just point out. Um, More people applauding, though, right? Uh, I'm not no. so About sure. 52, I'm not so I'd sure. Um, <laughs> Vicky, as a for... The reason why Brexit hasn't happened is because Parliament looks like this panel. There are four of you who voted Remain and just me who voted Leave, and that's about There's the ratio. There's only one so. person in this panel who is campaigning to Remain, I'd just like to point uh, right, out, which is Sean. But I think what we've discovered about the last three years is that how you voted in the referendum actually matters. And however many times you say that no deal is better than a mad deal, you actually have to mean it. <laughs> Let's take another question, because we've had so many in this evening, and I want to try and get around as many as I can, which is from Danny King. Um, with obesity-related cancers on the rise, is this really the right time to be reviewing the so-called sin tax? <laughs> yes, the man here at the front. <laughs> I just want to sort of turn it around a little bit. I'm in advanced stages of renal cancer, and the consensus is that that's... Sorry, you said you are? Yes, I am. I'm very um, sorry to hear that. No, no sympathy, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's generally considered from the people I've talked to that it's due to sort of excessive drinking of... Uh, how shall I say, a cola brand of the diet variety. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, maybe I should have stuck to drinking the uh, full proper sugar. full sugar, <laughs> been diabetic, fat, but I'd still be alive next year. You can look at it from both ways. Thank you for making that point. Yeah. <laughs> While some of the panel here were talking about the benefits of sugar tax, you had your head in your hands and you were shaking your head. I, I mean, it's extraordinary. You pointed to a study that was a prediction not about outcomes, it was a prediction. And the prediction turned out not to be true. Wherever there have been studies, long-term studies, about the effects of these things, particularly in the United States of America, what they found is people switch to different brands. They switch to cheaper brands, they don't buy less of the stuff. What Boris's policy isn't to end the sugar tax, it's to have the first proper review into the effects of the sugar tax. And I can't believe that I've just heard practically everyone in the panel just oppose evidence-based policy like that. You're proposing faith-based policy, not evidence-based policy, and we should want to see the evidence before we make sweeping changes like this. I mean, I think the man in the front row made the best point of the evening. It reminded me of the diesel scandal, where the EU told us that diesel cars were brilliant. They subsidised them, they said that we all had to drive diesel cars, and what do we find out a few years, um, a few years ago? Suddenly, diesel is, is the worst thing in the world and we shouldn't be using it. Perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to make these government-imposed judgments about how we should live our lives. And the idea of plain packaging for chocolates or for drinks, I think, is just authoritarian nonsense. Vicky? You will be faced with that choice at the next general election. You will be chased with, faced with two competing visions. One, Boris Johnson, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a known liar who has twisted and turned <laughs> on every public policy position going, who takes advice um, from far-right uh, white supremacists associated with Trump's White House. Um, and Jeremy Corbyn, who is... Oh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
What do you think when you get a reaction like that? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure what um, Steve Bannon is known to have been associated with um, with Boris Johnson. He is known to have advised him. That is absolutely without. I don't know what you're shaking Bullets. your head at, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's not go overboard with that word. Total. Total they, had one me they had one meeting ever. Why when, would you when meet he with was, Steve Bannon? Because he was the foreign secretary and Steve Bannon was in the White House as the chief advisor to the, pres as the, advisor of the, to the president of the United States. That's when they met. And then Steve Bannon comes over to uh, the UK, I think, two years and ago. And said he went back and, and forward on Boris Johnson's narrative. No, he didn't. That was actually a mistranscribed, mistranscribing oh. by a Guardian journalist. If you, if you listen to the audio in that clip, he's saying they went back and forth over text trying to organise a meeting, a meeting that never happened. This is Steve Bannon who tries to meet with every politician and a lot of them turn him down these days and for good reason. Boris didn't. Okay, wow. our panel is split, our audience is split and our time... That's a reflection of the country, which is exactly what you are, and our time is up. I'm so sorry, there's so many hands up. We'll be back in September. Uh, in Wandsworth, mind you, the way politics are going, who knows, we might be back earlier. <laughs> uh, so don't hold me to that. But for now, thank you to my panel, thank you to all of you here, and thank you to you at home for watching and listening. From Chichester, bye-bye. <laughs>as corporate businesses join the pride carnival many lgbt people still live in fear and violence matthew price takes up the story in beyond today on the bbc sounds app stay with us next tonight on bbc one for the big political stories this week